All right, so if we haven't met, my name is Mike, and it's an honor to be up here to be able to give God's word. Um, if we haven't met, like I said, come up front. I'll be down here, sitting down here. Shake my hand, yell at me, give me cries of outrage, whatever it is that you want to do. I'll be right up here, and I'd love to meet you. So we're going to continue in the Christmas series, and we're going to be talking about the king is here. And today I get the honor to talk about how he's going to be returning as well, right? And we're going to talk about the lion and the lamb. Last week, Pastor Eric kicked it off uh, great with how this kingdom is not of this world, right? And it's not about the big S, it's not about the Christmas trees, it's not about the lights, the presents, the candy canes, any of that stuff, but it's about Jesus. And it's all about Jesus and it's always been about Jesus. So like I said, this week we're going to talk about the lion and the lamb. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. You're truly worthy of it all, and we praise you as we sung about today, Father. So Father, as I always do, I pray, Father, remove me from the stage. Get me out of here. Let no words that are of me come forth, Father, but only the words that you have. Soften our hearts to hear what it is that you have for us. Let us receive what it is that you have. Father, open our ears to hear as well. And we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, we're going to talk about the lion and the lamb. And most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we see Jesus as either the lamb or we see him as a lion. And it just depends. I know myself, I have at time to time the seasons that we're in. And if we have lamb personalities at that time, we tend to focus our parts on the Bible where Jesus is meek, he's kind, he's loving, right? And if not, sometimes he's timid. But if we have that lion personality, sometimes in the Bible we focus on parts where he's strong, where he's firm, where he's urgent, where he's controversial. And that's not me at all. And sometimes appears as if he's aggressive. So I would ask you as we start off, where do you find yourself? Do you see him as the lion, the lamb? How do you see yourself, a lamb or a lion? I'm not going to tell you how I see myself sometimes. So many also say Jesus came as the lamb, right? He came in that manger, secluded, right? He came as this lamb to take away all the sin of the world, which is correct. And some say he's coming back as the lion, once and for all, defeating everything, right? Which is correct. But I'm telling you, he came as both. He was the lion and the lamb when he came. He was the lion and the lamb when he was doing ministry. He was the lion and the lamb today. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow and never changes. So when he comes back, you're going to see the lion and the lamb. But how can this be? How can he be the lamb of God and the lion of Judah? Let's look at the attributes of a lamb. So a lamb is powerless, right? No natural defenses, defenseless, right? Helpless, it's easily subdued, and it's prey for many, many animals. And I mean, they're like harmless little sheep. We tell kids to count them before they go to bed. Go count sheep, right? They're harmless. And in today's world, if you refer to Jesus as a sheep, It's completely different how our political parties have determined how they chose to redefine that word. Can I tell you, Jesus was no sheep in how the way they define what a sheep is. You see, it's far different usage what they use as what the Bible uses in the word of a sheep or a lamb. Revelation 7. After these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, all the tribes, peoples, and language, standing before the throne, before the lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. You see, God is personified as a lamb. There's a great multitude standing around the lamb and praising it. 
And I would argue, if you turn back two chapters, in the chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, you see probably the greatest example of Jesus as the lion and the lamb at one time. Starting in verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So there's no one found worthy to open the scroll and John is weeping because there's nobody that is worthy enough to open this. But keep reading. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So John hears him say, no, stop. Stop weeping. The lion, the lion of Judah can open. He's worthy. So John's getting ready to look and expecting to see this lion of Judah. But what's he see? I saw between the throne with the four living creatures... And the elders, a lamb standing as if slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So when you realize John's looking to see this lion, and he turns around and he sees a lamb, a lamb standing there. But you got to realize this just isn't any lamb that's standing there. This isn't this nice, ordinary, baby little lamb, this white and fluffy little nice lamb. It's as if it was slaughtered. How do they slaughter a lamb? Right? Bloodied. He's bloodied there. That's the lamb that he sees. And later on in chapter 5, they don't have this verse, but it came to me as we were singing today. It says, Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. To him who sits on the throne to the lamb be the blessing, the honor, the glory, the dominion forever and ever. That's that bloodied lamb they're talking about. You see this whole image of the entirety of the church, the multitude, all believers, all ages, gathering around and worshiping a lamb sounds foolishness on the surface. Right? It sounds crazy that you're worshiping this lamb if you remove it from the context of the Bible. You see, a concept that the Apostle Paul talked about and he wrestled with as he would be preaching and thinking about how people must be receiving and rejecting what he's saying. He says this in 1 Corinthians. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So for somebody in here, if you're sitting in here, it can sound foolish, worshiping a lamb, right? If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, but to us, it's the power. It's where the power is at, is in the blood. It's in the lamb. So let's look at the origins. Where do we get this context of Jesus being the lamb of God? In the Old Testament, prior to the Exodus, right, the children of Israel were instructed to take the blood of an unblemished lamb and put it on their doorpost and lentil, right? Why were they instructed to do this? Because judgment was coming. Judgment was coming to them, right? There was judgment coming to the part right here. Over and over and over again, right? Moses went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh rejected it, Pharaoh rebelled and said no, no, no. So Pharaoh had chosen rebellion and now he would experience the truth that the rebellion leads to judgment. So this judgment's coming. And rebellion is just as real in our day and age today. Right? There could be somebody in here that's just been rebelling. Ah, no, but God's got you here. And listen to what Paul says. He says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, what scripture tells us about ourselves is that we are all deserving. Each and every one of us is deserving of God's judgment. But God was working for your rescue before you even had a first chance to sin. 
So think about that. You don't need to clean yourself. If you're in here and you're like, I got to clean myself up before I come to him. You don't have to do any of that. He will do the cleaning. It says right here, God was working for your rescue before you even had a first chance to sin. That's good news. You see, while this judgment was intended for Egypt, there was preparation that the people of Israel needed to take. Think about preparation. There's always preparation for big events, right? Weddings, graduations, your oldest daughter going to college, right? There's always preparations for this stuff. And for the Israelites, this was the most important day of their lives up to this point right now, right? Judgment was coming. The Lord's judgment was coming upon Egypt. And there was preparation they had to do. He told them to take a lamb, not any old lamb, an unblemished lamb. Because Old Testament law, the unblemished lamb was used as a sacrifice, as a covering for human sin. So in those days, that lamb would be taken the place of one who had sinned because the penalty of sin is death. Paul tells us in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And as Pastor uh, Adam talked about over there, they're in a, in a hopeless nation over there right now. And we didn't plan this, but I'm talking about now there's a hope that's coming, right? Judgment was coming for them, but hope was promised. When the lamb was slaughtered, its blood was to be collected, and the blood was to be spread around the doorframe of the home. This is the Passover that he talks about, right? Christmas is wonderful. The birth of Jesus is great. This is what he told us to remember, the Passover, because it's always been about the blood. Exodus 12, for I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, fatally strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the human firstborn to animals and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will come upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood was important. But the blood wasn't a sign to the destroyer. What's it say? The blood shall be a sign for you. For you. Think about what must have been going on at that time, right? Wind and all this noise that's going on. Everything that's going on, this crying that's going on, these weeping that's going on, all this stuff that's going on. Think about this chaos, right, that could lead to fear at the time. And then they would question, are they truly safe? Are we, are we safe? And they could look, right, because he said that blood is a sign for you. They could look at the blood on the doorframe and remember, the blood of the lamb was directly related to their hope. It could be found in nothing else. When they were in the thick of it, when they were in the storm, they could look towards the blood as their sign, as a remembrance. This is why it's so important for you to have a daily encounter with Jesus, daily encounter with Jesus. This is why it's so important for you to be in communication with him daily, not just once in the morning. Meditate on his word day and night. Right? This is why it's so, so important, prayer, fasting, reading his word, spending time with him, soaking with him. This is why it's important. Because when things start to get bad, you look towards the blood. When you just focused on somebody else, you might be looking up, look at what God's done in their life. Look at what he's doing. He's changed and transformed them. And that's all you have. This is your mentor. And then they fail because they're going to. We're human. They're going to. And you looked up to them, you're like, how could this be? Something's revealed, whatever the case may be. You're like, how can this be? I thought they were just so good. And you can start questioning, is this true? Is this real? But no, you can look back to the blood, to your encounters that you have daily, and you can see what he's done in your life. Every single day of your life, you can see, no, I know this is real. I know what he's done for me. I'm not living off from your encounters. I'm living off from my sight on the blood of the lamb. Somebody's excited. You know what he's done for you. So just as the blood of the lamb saved them that day and they looked towards the blood, we look towards the blood of the lamb as well. The perfect sacrifice, that one time sacrifice. John writes this. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
First Peter, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You see, we remember Christ suffered, died on that cross for each and every one of us. A one-time act provides you with the hope that's to come, the freedom, provides you freedom from sin. You may be in here just fighting it. Just lay it down at the altars today at the end. Lay it down. Ask for forgiveness. Some of you need to forgive yourselves for the things that you've done. Lay it down. There's hope in Jesus. So Jesus as the lion now is a powerful apex predator. He's bold, fierce defender, fierce protector, few natural enemies the lion has. But what's the significance of the lion of Judah? Where did it come from? Before Jacob died, he blessed his sons. Genesis 49, as for you, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares to stir him up. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. You see, Jacob's, leg, well, Jacob's language here is prophetic. Can't get the words out of my mouth. This is significant because it heralds the lineage of Judah as of kings. Remember, Judah's line, King David, and then his descendants would rule over Israel until the time of the Babylonian captivity. And then Jesus Christ would come as a descendant of David and of Judah to forge a new covenant to usher in the new kingdom of heavenly glory. You see this lineage in Matthew. Furthermore, when Jacob says that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, he was also proclaiming the eventual eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ, who will reign forever as king, and that scepter being a symbol of his kingly authority and lordship. You see, all those kingdoms of all those ites that you read about in the Bible, right, they're gone. The kingdoms of the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Rome, they're gone. Whatever kingdoms of of this world are today will be gone, and there's one kingdom. There's one kingdom that will rule and reign forever, just as Pastor Eric talked about last week. That is it. You see, in the lion, we discover the power of Christ as this eternal king. And then as a lamb, we find the grace of Jesus as an internal, eternal savior. You see, the lion and the lamb are two images of Jesus. Images and names for God's used in scripture to describe the aspects of Jesus. The attributes of Jesus are as powerful as a lion and as innocent as a sacrificial lamb. All in the same instance. And the Bible presents this. It shows Jesus as the lion. It shows Jesus as the lamb. And sometime within two verses of each other, you see him as a lamb and then a lion. In Matthew 16, in the beginning of Matthew 16, he's teaching the Pharisees. He's talking about the Pharisees as he always does, right? And he's talking to them. And then later on in 16 in the middle, he's asking them, who do people say the son of man is? And Peter, right, he answered, You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now look what Jesus does. Jesus said to him, blessed are you because flesh and blood did not reveal this, but the father did. And then he goes on and tells them, and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, right? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose will be loosed, right? He tells them this. He's being this lamb. He's being this, this, this perfect shepherd with him, right? And he's no strong language at all. And then he goes on and tells them, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to have to suffer. This is what's going to happen. (laughs) And Peter, right? That's what Peter does. So Peter then hears this after he's just been told this. Think about it. He's just been told this, right? So now he's going to take Jesus and he says, he began to rebuke him. So now he's rebuking Jesus, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And what's Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. That's a lion. That's boldness, right? You see it in the same thing right here, the lamb and then the lion. He's like, get behind me, Satan. 
This isn't the will of the Father. You don't know. Get behind me. What about in John 2? In the very beginning of John 2, you see Jesus at a party. And they're telling him, hey, you know, we need, we need some more wine. He's like, it's not my time yet, not my time yet. But then he goes, right, and he turns water into wine. It can almost be like, well, did Jesus cave into what they wanted, right? Is this where he's being that little timid person or whatever, right? No. But then literally in 2.15, you read this. And he made a whip of cords. First off, how mad did he have to get? Righteous anger to make his own whip, right? To make his own whip, drove them all out of the temple area with sheep and oxen, poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. It's within verses of each other right here. You see the lion, you see the lamb, but it's the righteous anger that he had, right? They're making his house a den of robbers and he says, I will, my house will be a house of prayer, right? This is what he's talking about. So the key is allowing the Holy Spirit to empower you. You cannot do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to empower you to be the lion when you need to be and to be the lamb when you need to be. Those who are always the lion, right? I'm going to tell you a story later on. Will not only protect others from harm, but you're going to harm the ones you love. If you're always a lion, you will protect, but you're eventually going to harm the ones that you love. And if you are a lamb always, and you're always loving and kind and this safe people who avoid conflict, right? You're just going to allow the lions to rush in and take out all the other lambs. We have to be both. So let me tell you a story. Normally I ask my family before I tell them, but Caitlin's not here, so it's okay. <laughs> so for a long time, how I was with Caitlin is I was a lion, man. I was a lion with her. And it was because I wanted her to be tough. I wanted her to be independent. I was military, right? I was gone all the time. So I wanted her to be independent, not needing to rely on some guy to help her, protect her. I taught her how to shoot, right? Unless that guy that needed to protect her was daddy, of course, right? So I would be tough. And there'd be times when she would mess up or whatever the case, and I may not have always been the most forgiving father or said the right words to her, right? But as the Lord's worked on my life and changed and transformed me, right, and I continue to see things, if all she's doing is being a human being and she's not sinning and she's just making a mistake, why am I trying to make her live up to this level of perfection that I will never reach? What's the point, right? We cannot do that. It's okay to mess up. Let's just learn from it, right? So this past weekend... Caitlin had a photo shoot that she had to go to, right? So she brings all of her camera stuff in. She sets it up here in the office. She leaves. We leave. Everybody leaves. Church is locked. I'm 20 minutes away. She's 20 minutes away. And she calls, Dad, I left my batteries at the church. You kind of need those to take photos, right? She left them in my office. I was like, well, there's a key. You can grab the key to get into the church. But I locked my office, that key doesn't open my office, so now she's 20 minutes out, I'm 20 minutes out, I got to drive back after Ryan just drove all the way home in the rain, right, so there's a little stress there, right, so then now I'm coming back, she's coming back, and I get here and I can see the fear in her eyes, and it broke my heart, right, because she thought dad was going to yell, right, I looked at her and I said, what's wrong? Like, do you think I was going to come up here and yell at you? She goes, I thought I was in so much trouble. I was like, sweetie, you made a mistake. It's okay. You didn't sin. You made a mistake. You're human. Just learn from it. She goes, I'm setting my keys next to it next time. I was like, there you go. You learned your lesson, right? So there's a healthy fear, but there's also this time where we need to be a lion. We need to be a lion fighting for our, man, our families, men. We need to be a lion, right, fighting for our marriages. We need to be a lion defending our loved ones but we also need to be a lamb with them. We need to lovingly correct them. We need to correct them in a loving way, not in this dominating way. And if they mess up, it's okay. Just as Jesus was, who was Jesus a lamb to? He was mostly a lamb to the women and the children in the Bible. 
Who is he aligned to? Men. Arrogant, rude men. Religious, arrogant, rude men. You see that all the time in here. Here's a perfect example of it. The adulterous woman. Right? So Jesus is teaching. The Pharisees thinking they got him. Bring in this lady that was found to be in adultery, right? And what's the law of Moses say? She needs to be stoned. She needs to be killed, right? So they bring her in trying to get Jesus in this thing. And what's he say to them? Those without sin cast the first stone. And they all slowly go away until it's Jesus and her, right? And he's bending down, he's talking to her, and he's like, hey, this is my paraphrase. Where's all your accusers? Where's the ones that condemned you? She's like, there isn't any. He's like, I don't either. Now get up and go and sin no more. Not that she wasn't ever going to sin, but that that sin, adultery, don't do that anymore. Go. You see him being the lion and the lamb right in the midst of that exact story, flip and flop and both with whoever he needed to be a lion with and whoever he needed to be a lamb with. See, he was, a lion, or he was a lamb to those that put their trust into him, and he was a lion to those that did not. He was a lamb to those, he'll be a lamb to those in heaven, and he'll be a lion to those that spend eternity in hell. I'll show you in Revelation 21. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. I will give water to the one who thirsts, from the spring of the water of life without cost. The one who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and ab abominable and murderers and sexual immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Like I said, to those who are victorious, he'll be a lamb and to those that are not, he will be a lion. Rise to your feet with me. Well, you rise to your feet. I'm going to stay sitting. <laughs> Sorry. But Jesus came as the lion and the lamb. But can I tell you, when he first came, right, he came first wrapped in clothes as a baby. This is what this season reminds us of. And he was laid in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. It's like a secluded birth here, right? There wasn't many that knew about this. Except for some shepherds that were in a field. They had an angel and a multitude of armies that came to them praising God. That's what we see when Jesus came. So we've been worshiping and worship's been great. I want to worship one more time right here. Just for a couple minutes. Don't leave. Because I got a little bit more to go. But right now, just as when Jesus came in that manger and the shepherds came. And they just worshiped him for who he is. Let's do that right now. Just worship him. Give him thanks.